Great. So I want to welcome everybody to another teachingamericanhistory.org Saturday webinar. These Saturday webinars are sponsored by the Ashbrook Center at Ashland University. TAH.org is the leading online, online resource for documents, the documents-based study of American history, government, and civics for teachers, students, and citizens. I'm Chris Burkett, uh, associate professor here at um, uh, Ashland University, also co-director of the, the Ashbrook Scholar Program for undergraduates at Ashland University. Um, uh, the theme of this year's webinar series is Great American Debates. If you happen to be joining us for the first time, the purpose of these uh, webinars is to um, pull together some thoughtful scholars, and I'm happy to say we have two very thoughtful scholars today to help us think through a series of important debates in, in U.S. history. Um, please feel free to join into that conversation by submitting questions in the chat box. As always, we'll try to get to as many of those as possible. And also, in the next week, you will receive an email with a link to request a certificate of participation, as well as a link to the archived video and audio from today's webinar. Um, as always, we try to draw um, or, or, um, or build uh, our conversations on, on documents. And, and today, as in all the webinars this year, we're drawing on documents from our extensive collection of documents at TAH.org, as well as the new collection uh, titled Documents and Debates, which is available in either in print form uh, or as an ebook uh, through the website, through TAH.org. So I encourage you to take a look at that. So today we're talking about Federalists and Anti-Federalists, and uh, I'm very uh, happy to say we're, we're being joined by, again, two very thoughtful scholars on, on, on this topic. We have Gordon Lloyd uh, of the Ashbrook Center and Professor Emeritus at Pepperdine University and David Alvis of, of Wofford College. Uh, thanks to both of you for joining joining us this morning. Um, I've had the pleasure and honor of teaching uh, master's courses in our MAG program with, with both of these uh, fine gentlemen. And I can say without a doubt that both of them are not only very, very smart, but excellent teachers and also generally pretty, pretty good people. So I say generally, I don't want to, I don't want to overdo it. Um, but I, that's, this is such a great topic. It's one that, that I love very much, um, Federalists and Anti-Federalists. So I'm going to, I'm going to throw a question out and Gordon, I know you've written on this quite a bit, um, uh, as well as, uh, as, uh, as well as having put together some excellent websites, uh, on, uh, Federalists and Anti-Federalist debates, uh, among others, including the Constitutional Convention and Bill of Rights. But I'm going to start with a big question and let let both of you run with it um, or ignore it as you as you please. Um, so the sort of traditional historical narrative is that the uh, Federalists won the debate because the Constitution was ratified. Um, for two centuries, scholars, judges, justices, so on and so forth have have turned to the Federalist writings to uh, to sort of understand or clarify uh, their understanding of the Constitution. But wh why should we care uh, about what the Anti-Federalists argued? argued? Um, to, to what extent are the Anti-Federalists important in our understanding of the Constitution? Or maybe to put it another way, to what extent are they relevant uh, in, in, in that larger question? Gordon, you want to start? OK. Um I think it depends largely on whether you think the American narrative, as you put it, is made up of a series of turning points and conversations and choices, or whether you think the American narrative is in terms of collecting the writings of the winners in terms of, in terms of outcome. So I, like to put together that there are like four crises in, Amer in, in American public policy. What is the founding? There was a choice. Which way shall we go? And of, yeah, one side, quote, one, because it was ratified, but there are a lot of anti Federalist ideas within the Constitution. And, and those anti Federalist ideas, like the whole idea of term limits, for example, 
There's a problem in America today. At your LA Times yesterday suggested that one solution for an overpowerful judiciary was term limits for the judges. Now that, that's an issue that goes all the way back to the anti-federalists. So it seems to me that if you, so that was one crisis. Second crisis is Lincoln Douglas, Lincoln Tawney. Third crisis is Roosevelt, Hoover. Those are turning points. And the fourth crisis, of course, is are we in one now? And can we tell a crisis from, from not from a crisis? And I think it was that, that concept of crisis, conversation, shouting matches, et cetera, are important. So that to recover the anti-federalist is to recover the shouting match or to recover the conversation. And you learn in the end, either the anti-federalist was sufficiently accommodated, some of them, or that they were uh, defeated. And, they, and, and so I find it fascinating to recover conversations. And it's a legitimate conversation because uh, you can see when you get into it, there's an anti-federalist teaching on federalism, the role of the states, which is what usually is suggested. It is an anti-federalist teaching on republicanism and what does republicanism mean? Oh, that's great. So I'd love for David to jump in on this as well. Can I ask just a quick question yeah. on your thoughts, Gordon, your sort of introductory thoughts? So in terms of the debates, recovering the debates, recovering the shouting matches, as you put it, in light of those other four crises or the other three crises, um, can I just ask your, your, your thoughts on, well, let me put it this way. One of the things that impresses me most about these particular debates between anti-federalists and federalists is the de is the sort of depth of thought, the, the complexity of thought, that's not the right word, but the amount of thought that went into both sides of the argument. Um, how do the other, <laughs> have a thought on how the other crises or debates over crises uh, hold up to the to, to sort of the quality of the thought that went into the federalist, anti-federalist debates? Well, I think I, I mean, I don't think many people will dispute the quality of the Lincoln-Douglas debates, mm -hmm. the, 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 the incredible um, uh, what, what comes out of, of the, the claim for secession uh, uh, Calhoun makes. So I think that those debates are extremely, extremely important and reveal, uh, reveal a lot. I virtually nothing. When I started this idea of four crises, I knew virtually nothing about the 20th century crisis of um, FDR. I could, put, I could put that on a half a page. It's not until I tried to see whether or not there was a conversation or just a steamroll that I managed to discover Hoover, over seven years, actually had a conversation with with, with with Roosevelt. It, it doesn't measure up to the quality of the debates, I think, uh, the Federalist, Anti-Federalist, but it does measure up that to tell us that there are some that there's some big issues going on and that the nature of republicanism is at stake. The nature of what it means to be a democratic republic is at stake. What is the role of the judiciary? Uh, in, in overturning uh, decisions by a, a duly elected president. What is the role of Congress? So I mean, in terms of all of those issues I've just raised with regard to the third crisis in the 20th century, what's important is that it seems to raise the same, the same set of questions, which was at the founding, like, um, are we in a crisis? What, you, what, what are we arguing for? Good government. No, I want free government. Well, can I have both good government and free government? So what, what do I have to give up here to, in order to get that? that? That's part of a conversation. And it, it seems to me that's what we're talking about. Yeah, that's what, great. And, 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 and um, is, can we be half free and half slave? And, yeah. and, and at the beginning, I think the question is, can we be, can we be both Republican and monarchy? Hmm. Well, and I think the answer is no, and no titles of nobility, no <laughs> primogenitor. So certain things were settled as a result of that debate. They, neither anti-federalist nor federalist lost, they agreed. The, the disagreements are 
over what is republicanism? How do you work that out? And without yeah. falling into monarchy or falling into anarchy. And those are huge debates. And yes, the quality. Now, if you are, if you're really on the Federalist side, then, and you're trying to put together this debate between Federalist and Anti-Federalist, it's very interesting which Anti-Federalist you choose, which documents you choose to emphasize. And uh, um, if you choose somebody like Robert Whitehill, uh, uh, the, the crowd from Pennsylvania, the backwoods folks, you're not going to get what we call the best of the anti-federalists. You're going to get the best of the anti-federalists from reading Brutus, Federal Farmer, Sentinel. Um, but, but how do you know that? Because you know that their arguments are responded to by the federalists. And so that's where you get the debate. That's a great point. Yeah. So that, that's a that's a that's a great point. The last point, especially, is a great point that we, you know, for example, that, that those arguments were taken seriously enough by by the Federalists, including Publius, right, to to make sort of special note and really focus on trying to re respond to those questions. Some of them were even mentioned by name, I believe, in the Federalist. Papers, well, uh, yeah, yeah. Ham Hamilton does by by name when in 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 the latter parts, but clearly, in, at least to me. Federalist 78, dealing with the judiciary being the least dangerous branch, is a, is a, is a response to, to several later essays by Brutus, which, right. is, which claims that the judiciary is the most dangerous branch. And, and Anti-Republican, why? Because it's in there for life. So you have a th certain theory of republicanism, which emerges, are short terms in office, the key to understanding whether an institution is Republican, or can you have long terms in office and still say, well, it's Republican? And I, that's what the debate over the judiciary was in, in, in many ways. Uh, 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 and, and it's the same thing over the presidency, the length of term. Hamilton would argue in, in his June 18th speech at the convention, for example, that it doesn't matter how long the president is in office. It matters how the president got there. So mm -hmm. when you're thinking about monarchy, you anti-federalist, you men of, of dubious um, uh, character, uh, <laughs> uh, you're right. You think that monarchy is how long they're in there. But you have to think about how they got there. They didn't get there by election. So as long as the president is elected, that is the key to whether the whether the president fits in with the Republican model. And, but they debate that. And still today we debate whether right. it's how the person gets into office or whether it's how long the person is in office. Hmm. Well, that's great. D uh, David, thank you, Gordon. David, you've uh, I know you've written on many things, uh, but especially the executive. Uh, um, so I'd, I'd, at some point, if you're game, I'd love to hear your thoughts on who had the better arguments with regard to the executive, federalists or anti-federalists. But not, how do you how do you how do you approach this debate, and how do we yeah, let me, how yeah, do we think talk, what's important in this? Yeah, let me talk about just kind of the generally the debate in, in general, especially your question. You know, what, why read the anti-federalists? I mean, clearly they lost, so why 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 revisit the losers? And uh, I, I agree with Gordon, right? If I, if I were a nominee before the Supreme Court and I was asked, right, is the Federalist versus Anti-Federalist settled law? I think I'd answer no, right? Um, in fact, it continues to be a, an ongoing debate. And in fact, I think it continued to be an ongoing debate uh, after 1787. And I, I think it's an ongoing debate today, the positions that you see between the Federalist and the Anti-Federalist. So I, the... If you look at the achievement of the Federalists, right, it's creating, it's, it's the, their achievement consists in creating one of the longest lasting constitutions in world history. Um, and that's because they believe that solutions to government are institutional solutions, right? Um, good institutions make for good government. And I think that's true, and it probably points to the perseverance of the Constitution and why it's such a long lasting uh, document. On the other hand, what they don't really address, right, are the non-institutional uh, factors that are important to politics. Um, the cultivation of uh, a particular character of the people, uh, the importance of civic engagement, the nature of your political body, 
And those are the things that the anti-federalists really are concerned with. The anti-federalists, I mean, they're concerned to some degree with institutions, but really to them, the, the, be, the most important aspect of politics lies in the particular character of the people that constitute uh, a democratic uh, unity. And so their arguments are, you know, is big better, uh, in a, is big better or is small better? Well, it depends on the, where you can cultivate the best civic virtue. Small actually turns out to be better. So if you look at, like, for instance, what we're doing often with students today, you know, these kind of, uh, I would say, somewhat half-hearted, feigned attempts to cultivate um, concern for the common good, you know, civic engagement, service, things like that. You see that in some ways uh, institutions are not a completely adequate solution. We want citizens to be of good character and engaged in politics. And those are the things that the anti-federalists care about. And I think that argument still continues, right? Is politics about institutions or is politics about the character of the people? Now, that's a great point. By the way, that reminds me, David. The I was uh, it's it's not often written about, um, but that, that emphasis that that anti federalists put on something about the the uh, one of the chief virtues of state or even more local government is that they they can do things to sort of inculcate and maybe even maybe the terms regulate, but maybe it's promote. A certain kind of character, even when it comes to religion, one of the things I was really surprised to find about the anti-federalists was quite a few of them were concerned that sort of institutional going down the road of uh, of institutionalizing things, as you were saying, would undermine the uh, um, importance of promoting a certain kind of um, uh, sort of religious attitude among people of their states. Um, and, and, and what's interesting about among the anti-federalists is they don't emphasize right orthodoxy or doctrine of one particular type or the other, but right. rather some homogeneity when it comes to religion, because right. you what you want is to avoid sects or factions right that end up just uh, incapable of working together. So you need some you know one of the big things right with the anti-federalists is. That, that homogeneity of the community, people who can share common values and therefore can work together uh, towards a collective notion of the common good. Yeah, that's great. And by the way, so that you brought up faction, David. This is uh, mm -hmm. this, this question of how do you prevent faction? Because it seems that both Federalists and Anti-Federalists were aware that, um, as Madison, I think, put it in 10, you know, faction is, is the mortal disease of, of republics, right? And, and both Federalists and Anti-Federalists, I think, generally acknowledge that, but they had very different um, solutions to how you deal with that problem of faction. So could either of you sort of, because this is uh, maybe even before we get into the arguments with regard to particular aspects of the Constitution, uh, a bigger question has to do with how do you, how do you avoid this faction stuff, or at least the problem of faction. So. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great question because that to me that's what I really uh, focus a lot on when I teach the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists is the very different way that they approach the problem of faction, and as you can see from the suggested reading we have uh, for uh, today's webinar from Brutus, right? Brutus, right towards the middle of that um, that that piece, he emphasizes right the importance of the sameness of the population, the homogeneity of the population. Um, because, right, it's only when you share values that you can deal with the problem of faction, right? Um, it requires a, a, a community with a sort of collective notion of the common good. And it's interesting how absolutely opposite the solution of Federalist 10 is, right? The, the solution to the problem of majority factions, according to Federalist 10, is that you want more factions, right? So factions counteracting factions, ultimately uh, annul one will annul the other so that no one group can dominate. And in some ways, right, they do seem to have different understandings of human nature. Uh, I think Brutus seems a bit more optimistic about the capacity of human beings to work together, whereas uh, Federalist Ted really draws a dark uh, uh, characterization of human, uh, of human behavior, right? Our, our, act, our, act, our, our, our notions of the common good are generally motivated by self-love. And uh, ultimately, right, people cannot be judges in their own cases. 
So human beings are, act, are motivated by self-interest, and therefore the best way to deal with them is to have self-interest counteracting self-interest, right? Um, ultimately diluting the, the faction. So there I think you see that the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists are very far apart when it comes to the problem of faction, and particularly how to deal with the problem of majority faction. Yeah. So, so uh, <coughs> please, Gordon, go right ahead. Well, I'm I, I'm glad that David introduced this notion of character. The way he put it is anti-federalist for character, rather than institutions and federalist for institutions, and they don't say much about character. And so the debate, as as I think he sharply puts it very nicely, is character versus institutions. And I want to model that and a bit and say that the kind of institutions that the anti-federalists is just perfectly in harmony with the kind of approach that David has taken. I'm just putting my own twist on it. Is that the kind of institutions the anti-federalists were um, were concerned with reflects what they think about human nature and character. And I think that they understand the number one temptation is to be power. But somehow, even, even if you elect your brother, there's something about the office of the, of the office holder which is potentially corrupting. So it's not the people per se that lack the character. And we really don't have to spend a lot of time on the character, uh, I, I, I think. Um, but to be sure, homogeneity, and that, that's fine. But it's the, it's the corrupting influence of power that once you get into office. And that's why we need short terms in office, rotation in office, and send the people back to the homogeneous community and learn what it means to farm the land again so that you so that you rule and if you want to be Aristotelian about it, you rule and be ruled in turn so that you don't develop a professional class. I think a great concern then is the length of term in office, the number of times you can uh, be, be reelected because the, because what is the corrupting influence on the character of the people is this power. And it's not just power in the community. It's somehow power in office. And I think that drives both the, fed, the, the, the federalism aspect of the anti-federalists, uh, the, the idea that localities create this, this sense of community and self-governing, but it also governs their republicanism, which is you don't, uh, power corrupts. And I think on the federalists understand, I think the more you go beyond Federalist 10 and you go into federal, that whole range of papers that Madison is writing from Federalist 37 through 51 and then into 55, et cetera, you see a greater concern, I think, with character because exactly the anti-Federalists are raising the question, well, what are you doing about people who don't have to take a, a, a put up their hand and say, I believe in God. The state constitutions from which the anti-federalists are emerging virtually all have some kind of oath of office linked to, uh, but Madison doesn't have much faith in oaths in office. As David said, you know, it's faction against faction. That's what's going to work. Pieces of paper don't work. Oaths don't work. So yes, it's, Federalist 10 is grim. I think as you start getting on in the Federalist papers, the, the grimness tends to be blunted so that he says, 55 and 57, those who think that, that, that we don't need virtue in the people, um, what are they talking about? So it's almost like there's a presumption that there is virtue in the people. Um, and in the Virginia Ratifying Convention, at Madison says, Look, I understand that these, we're talking about institutions, which he called auxiliary precautions. Uh, but what we, I mean, th to think that we could have a Republican government with, without the people having sufficient virtue and intelligence to choose representatives of sufficient virtue and intelligence, that's just wild. So he doesn't spend a lot of time on it. You're absolutely correct. And one of our heroes, he, uh, Wilmore Kendall, uh, I say our, because I think David has Kendall 
and certainly through his father as a, as, as a hero, often point about there's a missing Federalist paper, and that's supposed to be on civic education. But I think what what he's what Madison is doing is is yeah he's preparing for the worst. You don't build. I think his point is you don't build a regime which is supposed to last into remote futurity by hanging on to the dream that men are angels. Mm -hmm. But you can't. But here's what I would defend Madison from the critique that they're not interested in character. But if men. But if all right, so men aren't angels. But if men were beasts, free government would not be possible. Right. So there must be some. So the idea is why is he emphasizing factions so much when, in fact, you will find him in the later Federalist Papers and certainly at the Virginia Ratifying Convention talking about character. So that maybe one one issue would be with with Federalist Papers. He can't have it both ways. It's either institutions or character. And I think both sides, to go back to David's sharp point about character versus institutions, both sides, I think, can say it's not either or, it's both. And right. it's a certain kind of character. Um, I think the anti-federalists say it's those whom we elect, even though we elect our brother. Um, and more likely, we're going to elect aristocrats. And that's what Madison responds to. No, we're not going to elect aristocrats. Nonsense. The people aren't going to do that. What do we think? People are so stupid. They, won't, they can't do that. So I think that the idea of, of where, what kind of character and what is the character, um, what spoils us, what makes us uh, vicious in a, in a certain sense. Uh, what is the corrupting influence? And Madison seems just to say, we don't have to look far for it. It's all over the darn place. And I think that um, anti-federalists are saying, well, let's focus on those in power. Mm -hmm. And, so, well, don't we elect them? Yeah, we elect them. But, they, <laughs> but that's not enough. So both sides agree that elections are critical. Both sides agree that elections aren't enough. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> so what are these auxiliary precautions? I think that the, the Federalists say long terms in office. Right. And, and the anti-Federalists say short terms in office. Right. So by the way, Gordon, so Gordon, you, you used the phrase auxiliary precautions. I was actually going to bring that up. Madison uses that phrase twice in the Federalist Papers. And when I think about auxiliary precautions, sort of along the lines of, of, what, you're, of, of what you're saying, I think is... What are the what are these things auxiliary precautions to? Um, that is, you know, all of these sort of institutionalized things are not meant to replace that character or that virtue. They're backups to those uh, moments, right? Those uh, uh, what he calls in various other places um, um, inordinate passions or irregular passions, perhaps those moments where. Uh, that virtue yeah, may yeah. be lacking or doesn't quite come through. Um, by the way, I'm also not I'm not uh, I'm not sure that Madison, when he writes in Federalist Ten and even a little bit in Fifty One about multiplying factions, I'm not sure Madison thinks there will always actually be factions, at least as he defines them. Um, but but will there be factions, or at least is there the possibility for factions arising? You have to say yes, in light of a realistic understanding of human nature. And so what you need through these inventions of prudence uh, are ways to sort of mitigate or, 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 um, or deal with those, those uh, factions when they become potentially dangerous. Um, I know I'm just thinking out loud here. Well, I think, I think both, if we go back to what they do agree on, I mean, they, uh, what they agree on is... The, the the basic the, the basic point of departure I think that they agree on it is consent. Now that's why they can so quickly uh, say no titles of nobility. Every state every state constitution that was created after 1776 created that quote republican form of government. So mm -hmm. there's a certain understanding of consent as a point of departure. And then you get into the business 
of uh, well, do we have two do we have two branches? Uh, do we have a government? What is the point of so we, we are rethinking? Um, what does a system of consent imply then with regard to for 2,000 years we've had uh, executives or monarchs, we've had uh, aristocrats in a quote upper house, we've had judges hanging around somewhere with the common law. I mean, so how do we put all this together based on consent? And so I think they agree. So but consent is not going to carry the day because if everything just based on consent, why don't we just have an assembly put together? And then Bannister says, well, if, if every Athenian was a Socrates, it would still be a mob. <laughs> so we need some filter, we need some filtration, some filters, some auxiliaries to to as a backup for elections. So for example, as you pointed out, it, Say the say the people get to be irrational or intemperate, and they have an election, and that that intemperate quality goes into the house. I think the purpose of the Senate is to moderate that, and they can do that because they're not quite up for election. At least two thirds of the body is not up for election immediately, so they can, through a larger district and longer terms, here's 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 the difference coming out now. So through the longer terms in office, say the Federalists, they can resist these temporary delusions by the people until they get the time to wake up. So the auxiliaries aren't supposed to run the show. The auxiliaries are supposed to give people the time to have enlightened consent. Enlightened leaders aren't always going to be there, and the people themselves aren't always going to be enlightened. But that doesn't mean to say that we're dealing with a bunch of knaves. We're dealing right. with people. We, we want to build something that's going to last forever. And I think the anti-federalists in many ways say, you know, you know what does last forever? Right. Yeah. Great and question. the auxiliaries, the auxiliaries that we need are auxiliaries, yes, which help the election system. But we need to focus on what is the what is the source of danger to liberty? What is the source of danger to a system based on consent? And the anti-federalists are still working in the idea of the monarchy or the one or the few. The one or the few in power are the ones who who represent the greatest danger to a system of consent and liberty. So we need auxiliary precautions to assist the people to govern themselves. And that means being able to build in restraints to control an executive and a judiciary and even a Senate. One of the fascinating things for me is that the anti-federalists are supposed to be uh, are, are presented mainly as states' rights people. And the Senate is the state's branch. The anti-federalists at the, at the Constitutional Convention, the anti-federalist disposition won that. That's in the Constitution itself with states' e equal representation. But if you look at some of the nastiest, vicious critiques that the anti-federalists made, we're against the Senate. And that's why? right yeah. and, and why so that right. that becomes an issue well it's answered i think if you realize the anti-federalists have a republican teaching not mm -hmm. just a state's rights teaching and the republican teaching is do we agree with the federalists that we should have separation of powers yes well let me tell you something the senate violates the separation of powers it participates in the executive it mm -hmm. it, it does the judiciary it participates in, in passing legislation. It is the branch which has the greatest potentiality for consolidated government in the Senate. And look at the length of terms. And so right. that, that, that becomes the anti-federalist challenge, yeah. that they represent the states, and yet the Senate is a, a dangerous branch. Yeah. I think one of the in, interesting questions would be down the line, in terms of trying to figure out anti-federalist federalists. Why did the anti-federalists want a Bill of Rights? And secondly, if you ask, it, 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 there's a second question. Ask the anti-federalists, ask the federalists, which do you think is the least dangerous branch?
I mean, I, I, I want to I want to take up to that 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 question of the Bill of Rights and and, for, and first of all address something that Gordon was talking about because and this is really an important issue the way he frames it right and that is when you read the Federalists versus the Anti Federalists and the the Federalists are always talking about institutional solutions to political problems right and um, and particularly, particularly the auxiliary precautions, right? It is true, you know, that for instance, you know, and Federalist 51, Madison says, you know, a, a due dependence upon the people, of course, is the primary check on government, but experience has taught mankind the need for auxiliary precautions. And the big question is, are those auxiliary precautions like checks and balances and uh, the system of, of uh, diluting connections described in Federalist 10, are they meant to be substitutions for uh, democratic, uh, the quality of for, for, for good citizens, or are they meant to be simply kind of a backstop in case, you know, of the, in, in, in case of a, of a few abuses of uh, democratic politics? And there, there's a very interesting piece, there's a very interesting response to these auxiliary precautions by one anti-federalist named Sentinel, and Sentinel makes this case, it says, look, you know, if you have a constitution that's designed to deal with, a cell, with, with human nature, it, that's, that's premised upon the assumption that human, na human beings are self-interested, and therefore, right, you design the system of checks and balances uh, as a way of, of preserving the separation of powers, then ultimately, right, you're going to displace or marginalize the importance of cultivating character because you're going to have these institutions that can solve these problems. And so ultimately, the argument of Sentinel is that this constitution is really bad for the character of the people, because ultimately what you have here is a, a system of government. One, I remember one political scientist put it like this. It's a, the founders designed a system of government that could, that it was a system designed by geniuses that could be run by idiots. Right? And ultimately, right, when you find something with all these fancy institutional solutions, ultimately, there's not going to be the incentive to care really about uh, the character of the people. The, the debate over the Bill of Rights, right, reflects this debate in an interesting way. And that is, you know, for the anti-federalists, I mean, part of their strategy for pushing for a Bill of Rights is a kind of rhetorical strategy against the Constitution. You know, it works really well, right? These people don't care about rights. That's why they don't have a Bill of Rights. But the real concern I think they have is, is that, look, you know, government is about the quality of citizens. And a declaration of an, uh, a Bill of Rights clearly establishes a sort of education for people. And that's where you really find the, the, the most important protection of individual of, of uh, the most, uh, the, big, the best bulk, bulk work, again, uh, against despotism is in the, uh, well educated people who know their rights. And if you look at that piece by Madison that we have for today, Madison sort of says, look, at the end of the day, I really don't see the benefit um, in the end of these things because protecting rights really is about finding good institutional solutions to the problem of politics, primarily majority rule. And I don't really at the end of the day see how a bill of rights really contributes to that. Um, ultimately, it will be a it's, a it's a weak solution because the best solutions come from institutional solutions, not so much from uh, the education of uh, education of the people. Well, uh, David, by the way, I'm glad you I'm glad you raised that because uh, the, 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 the Bill of Rights or maybe it was Gordon, but I'm glad you elaborated on it because, again, yeah, Madison does say, right, he doesn't see the necessity of a Bill of Rights. Um, that the sort of institutional arrangements are sufficient safeguards against rights and will do a better job than, than any listing of rights. But I've, yeah. I wanted to ask you and Gordon both about your, 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 your thoughts on the Federalist critique of the anti-Federalist, um, you know, insistence on a Bill of Rights, because the way that's portrayed, at least in the Federalist papers, and I know it's portrayed in other Federalist writings, that... Um, the, the, the Federalists tend to portray the Anti-Federalists as a sort of these naive, um, uh, inexperienced and, and deep political contemplation. Uh, they're just sort of naive in thinking that a Bill of Rights is the solution to everything. I, I actually think that the Anti-Federalists 
insistence on a Bill of Rights is much deeper than that. And I'm glad, David, that you you mentioned one of those things is, and that what one of those things is, and that's that it 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 has an educative uh, purpose. It can, in fact, be used if you have an, a, a a sort of um, uh, sufficiently enlightened, uh, sufficiently Republican in character people, they can they can they can turn to that Bill of Rights as as the standard by which they can uh, at least you know sort of marshal their forces against uh, acts that are unconstitutional and potentially tyr uh, tyrannical. But uh, yeah, but I, I, go ahead, please. On, on that, I mean, it's interesting. So one of the funniest summaries I ever heard of the Federalist critique of the Bill of Rights, right, was uh, Gordon one time came uh, to my uh, university and gave a summary, gave a, started with a quick summary of Federalist 81. And if you look at the way that uh, uh, Hamilton summarizes the argument against uh, the, uh, the Bill of Rights, he said, Ham Hamilton says, okay, first of all, a Bill of Rights is um, unnecessary. Second of all, a Bill of Rights is dangerous. And third of all, a Bill of Rights, right? The Constitution already has a Bill of Rights, which these right. seem <laughs> rather contradictory arguments. Right. The, uh, but the point, I think the major point of the Federalist, right, on something like a Bill of Rights is that, you know, parchment barriers are not effective restraints on power. The only effective restraints on power is power, right? And so that ultimately only institutional solutions work at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And I, th I think the anti-federalists, right, their argument goes deeper. They don't believe, right, necessarily that parchment barriers are solutions, but they believe that um, the that really, right, every corruption, every violation in government is really the result of a betrayal of the trust of the people by yep. one's representatives. Good. So if yeah. you know what your rights are, and if you know what the separation of powers ought to be, right, on paper... That's good enough because then the people should check their representatives by simply not reelecting them. So right. that's the most effective, right? Active political participation is the most effective restraint yeah. on, on government. And I'm not sure that the Federalists really buy that. Yeah. Well, that's, I the I, problems I, come from the people themselves. Go ahead, Gordon. Gordon, please. Go okay. Ahead, Gordon. No, I, th this idea of the Bill of Rights linked to character and as an educative function. Uh, let, let's say there's an, uh, without doing an either or, but it, it has two. Uh, say it has an educative function and it has a, uh, shall we say, a policy function. Uh, maybe the word policy could be uh, altered. But yes, very, about half the states, um, when they, between 1776 and 1780, when they created their, their state constitutions, the, began with a Bill of Rights. So Bill of Rights was prefatory and had a lot of language like should, it, it, it had uh, uh, character building, character saying this is who we are, this is sort of like a mission statement. And then the Constitution is supposed to carry these things out. So that it had an educative, purposeful function. The other half of the states had their Bill of Rights inside the constitution. So I would say that has a power function or a policy function so that the legislative branch can't do this. The legislative branch can't do that. So it has a power or policy function. So it depended upon whether the, I think definitely educative if you see it at the beginning and they weren't called a bill of rights. Most of the time it was called a declaration of rights. And what this, the difference is between declaration and bills is, is it, Sometimes they're just used interchangeably, uh, uh, it, it, and I don't think that's a, a debate worth getting into. But basically, I think if you want to, the educative function is more de declaratory. Um, comes at the beginning, like a declaration of independence is a declaration of mission. And then when you have a constitution, and you put a you put a bill of rights. Then there's a bill of rights. There's a listing of things that the government cannot do. Um, so I think that's the kind of tradition that the anti-federalists are are coming from, the state constitutions. And Madison is saying that the state constitutions 
have, in fact, or the state legislatures haven't obeyed this. He can give he gives examples in the in, in the vices, so that the whole point is to uh, get away from this. The educative function doesn't seem to be working, and the restraining of of policy by legislature doesn't seem to be working. We need to rethink all of this. So the thing, the Bill of Rights does not actually enter, as David quite correctly says, into the basic conceptual framework of the Federalists, because they're thinking that an institute, a different set of institutions are needed. Oaths, pieces of paper don't work. I, the, the second and last point here is, I have a, a I mean, it's, it's my rendition, but I think Madison might very well say in his own in his own way, my rendition is, you guys are still fighting 1776. We're now in the 1780s. We're in the 80s now. No longer in the 70s. Right. <laughs> you, you, you guys are still fighting the monarch and the aristocrats, and where a Bill of Rights has a tradition of restraining. I mean, the Bill of Rights was part of the rights of the people. And restraining, restraining power in office, yes. But we've won that battle, didn't you hear? Yeah. So right. why are you continuing to restrain the, the people who are in office? They're not aristocrats, they're not monarchs. You elected them. We need, we need auxiliary precautions of a political nature. Um, and then when, when Madison gets pushed by the the sensible, what I would call sensible anti-federalists, that's what we're used to, that's what Americans are used to, it's a prudent, it's an educated function, and it can also restrain from time to time if in fact the, 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 the Congress gets out of control, but it won't read Federalist 45, oh, okay. well, all right, we'll do it, we'll do it. What did Madison want to do? He wanted to open up the Constitution and put a Bill of Rights inside it, like Article 1, Section 9, to restrain the powers of Congress. He, and also, he wanted right. to extend the preamble to include the Declaration of Independence and the educative function. So, yeah, David is right. There's an educative function. I would also add there's a power function. And the power function goes back to where do you think the danger to liberty comes from? And I think that the anti-federalists pre, precede uh, Lord Acton, does that power in office corrupts, can corrupts um, absolutely. Uh, therefore, you need a Bill of Rights as an educative function for the people to remember. Every generation you can lose it unless you remember it. And also as a power function to remind the people in power that they, that they shouldn't betray the people's trust, to use David's phrase, which I think is very good. Um, so I, I, I think that's the debate. It's yeah. not like, see, I think this is wrong, in my mind, to portray the anti-federalists as old-fashioned Greek Republicans or Roman Republicans uh, who, who are relevant because they had the opportunity in 1789 to challenge the commercial republic of Madison's Federalist 10 by going back to, I don't know, Sparta, going back to farmland <laughs> or whatever, and they didn't have the guts to do it. That's Herbert Storing's thesis. So the anti-Federalists are part of the debate because part of the debate is the ancients versus the moderns. And they could have been ancient. They could have done that. Uh, I think that's personally, uh, it, it, missing the debate, the core of the debate between the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists, as much as I admire Story, and then Story is incredibly important for bringing this debate back. Uh, Pocock is important for bringing this debate back. Gordon Wood is important, but both of both Pocock and Wood see them as somehow Anti-Federalists as part of our old-fashioned Republican tradition. Um, sort of anti-enlightenment. And I, I, I just don't see that. that. That's making it the debate, again, between ancients and moderns, where I think this is, how, this is a new world problem. This is how much of the old world do we want 
how much of the new world are we going to have as a new way of going about things? So right. I think there's a fundamental agreement between the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists about consent and right. about Republicanism. Where they differ is what the heck does that mean and how do we work it out? And David is right. Uh, the, the, uh, I think the, the Federalists rely much more on institutional approach than, say, on character. The well, as, you know, they, they rely on the character of ambition. And uh, you let ambition counteract ambition. So there's a certain uh, teaching from Adam Smith that somehow if you let each people take care of themselves, the outcome will be good. Um, it's not, I, I, the idea that somehow they created, to use a, David's phrase of a, this is a great system which even knaves can do, I think that's going too far. Um, uh, not David's going too far, the person who presents that is going too far. It's true that enlightened statesmen will not always be at the helm, but that doesn't mean to say that enlightened statesmen will never be at the helm. Right. Or that, they, or that because uh, a good, good, uh, selfless character is in short supply, doesn't mean to say that there aren't people who have that and we need people who, I mean, if you can't compromise and you can't deliberate, then, uh, then th th this system isn't going to work. And I think part of the anti-federalist, federalist debate is at the end, uh, the anti-federalists themselves divided into those who wanted to work within the system, to use that language, and those who didn't. And Madison could work with those who wanted to work within the system. Interesting. And that's where we get the inclusion of the Bill of Rights, uh, because those who didn't want to work within the system wanted to go back to the Articles of Confederation. Hmm. And, uh, I, 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 and if you're interested in working, then the, the criteria for success changes. It's not you want to create a perfect union. You want to create a more perfect union. Uh, so the test for Madison is, is this better than what we had before? Right. And, and, and I think the anti-federalists managed in some way to say, yes, as long as we keep the notion of a Bill of Rights for educational purposes and for policy purposes, right. then we can go along with this. We can, because now we have our protections against uh, the abuse of office by those in power. Right. You know, interestingly, the anti-federalists led with the Bill of Rights as, as, as part of their objection. It, 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 Hamilton didn't take, Hamilton really said, he did it in seven, February 17, but that was light stuff. He really didn't take on the <laughs> Bill of Rights seriously until, as David said, it, you get to the 80s, the Federalist 81, 84, et cetera. Right at the end, the, with, with, with the, deba uh, the debate is in effect over, and Hamilton then deals with it. Right. The uh, story likes to, to, to say that the, the anti-Federalists criticize the Constitution and the Federalists criticize the anti-Federalists. But <laughs> I want to put one wrinkle on that, and that right. wrinkle is the single most um, spoken about peace other than the Constitution. Now, the thing about is James Wilson's State House speech, which he gave in October of 1787, as the debate began. And the anti federalists latched onto that because that's the speech where Wilson says we don't need a Bill of Rights. And that right. becomes, so in that way, the anti federalists are responding to the Federalists. A defense of the Constitution. So the wrinkle I'd put on Storing's claim that anti-federalists criticize the Constitution, the federalists criticize the anti-federalists, is to remind folks that the single most uh, um, cited piece by the anti-federalists is, is Wilson's State House speech. Yeah. And, that, and so the, their, their claim about the Bill of Rights, the anti-federalists claim about the Bill of Rights, begins right there at the beginning before Federalist Number 1 is even written. No, that, that Federalist 1 is published the day before Wilson's State House speech. Yeah. But Hamilton doesn't cover it until the, all the debates are over. Right. Yeah, I've always, by the way, Gordon, I've always thought that, that I've never considered anyway uh, Wilson's State House speech to be 
an act of great prudence as a way to introduce these debates because of <laughs> oh, the way he well, lays I mean, just, things out. Just give it say, my goodness, what? I mean, hey, as David has put, we, that, that, uh, we don't need a Bill of Rights because it's unnecessary. We don't need a Bill of Rights because they're, they're dangerous. But we have a Bill of Rights, and, and it's not dangerous. Yeah. So why not just, you know, go right to the heart of the thing that anti-federalists in their Republican, you know, beliefs find to be most important, right? So Wilson, I think, uh, <laughs> takes a stab at the thing they care about most in a certain sense because of its because it reflects in so many broad ways, as you and David are both laying out so nicely, their their broader understanding of republicanism. So um, we have we have a, a number of questions coming in. I have several questions that I'd love to ask, but I'm going to defer to some that are coming in. First, let me start with um, uh, just for clarification from uh, M.A. Christie. Uh, I'm not clear on how the Bill of Rights are educative. Can somebody clarify that, please? Yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah. A, no, that's a good question, right? You know, how if they're a part of the legal body of the Constitution as, as amendments, how, are, how do they serve an educative function? So the thing is, is that by the, uh, the anti-federalist argument is, look, by including these in the original document, right, um, the original Constitution forms what you could call the social contract. And one of the arguments of the anti-federalists had always been, look, a social contract should contain all of our values. It shouldn't just be about how you institutionally organize government. It should contain all of our values so that it's passed on from one generation to the next. And they knew that, you know, a, a constitution is going to be more important than any statutory law because people will always remember and refer back to the constitution, whereas they won't know necessarily a, a body of statutes. So that, you know, when you carry, you know, when you carry around your pocket constitution, and you've got all the Bill of Rights in it, you can say, well, you know, that's wrong because of this, you know, th this right, and that's wrong because of this right. So it serves an educative function in which, you know, one generation passes to the next, right? These are your fundamental rights. These are the limits of government. Yeah, yeah I would agree with that. And it's also uh, the shorter, the sweeter. Yeah. Uh, if you want to take, it used to be uh, up until several years ago that on the 4th of July, families would read the Declaration of Independence. And that reminds them as, a, as an educative function, well, what is this country about? What, what do we stand for? And then the Constitution uh, is linked to that. And part of the whole Difficult, the narrative of American politics has been what's the relationship between the Constitution and the Declaration? Is it a fulfillment or is it a betrayal? And I think the educated function of, the, of, um, of a Bill of Rights is to, to actually change the language, for, just for education purposes, change the language from a Bill of Rights to a Declaration of Rights. So that helps us to think of the Declaration of Independence, a Declaration of Rights. This is who we are. This is why we're doing it. Uh, uh, just government is based on the consent of the people. It, it is prudent that we do things uh, through discussion. Sometimes it comes that we have to declare these are a prince. So that you, you could read to your kid at night. You know, let's just read the, the, the Declaration of Rights of Virginia. Let's read the Declaration of Rights of Massachusetts. All those come first. So as to support David's point, if we, to, uh, to help the, the person who asked the question, if for the purposes of understanding that we change the language Bill of Rights to Declaration of Rights, Think about a Declaration of Independence. Thinking about it coming first, before the before the laws, um, that it comes first in chronology. It comes first in the order of the way which we put it, and it's shorter and it's sweeter. That that is something that one can read and understand who we are and what we stand for. As David said, those are our values. This is our mission statement. By the way, that's great. That's sorry. Did you want to keep going, Gordon? I didn't mean to well, cut you off. I mean that's the educational function. But yeah. if we keep the language of Bill of Rights, we we think of it much more legalistically. That is, we're thinking of it in terms of restraining power, and that no Congress, you can't do that. It's it's much less educative. I think it's much less. This is who we are. 
and much more you can't do that. Uh, and I know it's, a fine, it's a very, very fine distinction, but um, like David, I'm trying to, to help the, the person who sent the question understand how it could be educated um, rather than simply, uh, I don't mean simply, rather than a bill, a, a bill of what you can't do, which right. is restraining a bill, a bill in the sense of a list. Right. If you think of a, a bill of rights, like a list of rights, a declaration of rights, don't necessarily list, but they tell a story. Yeah. That's great. That's, that's very useful. But so, by the way, so on this same question, then the, the, the sort of educative purpose or, or value, anyway, of the bill of rights, uh, Gordon, you said the sh at one point the shorter and the shorter the better, right? So that that points me to uh, the question Dan submitted: uh, Does the fact that the Bill of Rights is cited cited so often in courts prove its relevance? I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. But I also want to add to that a little bit and ask: In light of the shorter is better thing, we know that the Bill of Rights has it, we think of it anyway. We tend to think of it these days as uh, the the Bill of Rights as with all of the Constitution, sort of rests in the hands of the courts. Yes. Uh, it doesn't seem so, uh, once it's in the hands of the courts, that shorter is better because perhaps it's more clear. It doesn't seem to be applicable anymore to the Bill of Rights because it turns out, at least according to the courts, there's so much more there than sort of what initially meets the eye. So I want to throw out a broad question. It's, it's hypothetical, but... Uh, uh, since the Bill of Rights is in the hands of the courts, is that what the Anti-Federalists would have wanted? Or maybe even isn't this sort of contradictory to what the Anti-Federalists wanted in fear of their general concerns, at least Brutus's concerns, for what the courts would do with with the Constitution, let alone a Bill of Rights? I didn't ask the very question very clearly, but what would the, what would the Anti-Federalists think of the Bill of Rights today? That's the question. And if you don't want to tackle that, that's fine. Uh, we can we can uh, talk about whatever you I, want. I, I, my my first response is that I don't think they would. Uh, I don't think that they would buy into the, the one of these abominations that come down from time to time. And the abomination I'm talking about now is the following: that we live under a constitution, but the constitution is what the Supreme Court says it is. Yeah. I don't think the the anti-federalists would buy that, and I think the federalists would. In fact, I would I would say that the that's one of the anti-federalist warnings, that be, that and, and that's what Matt Hamilton in seventy eight is responding to. It will never happen. Congress won't let it happen. Right. Uh, the judges will be tied down by precedent, and will only exercise this power. When the when 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 the legislative branch uh, at the state level or the or the national level violate the manifest tenor, I don't know. It has to be pretty obvious for the judges to be involved. The Constitution, in that sense, does not belong to the judges. I think both sides would agree. So, what do we do about the Bill of Rights today? I think it shows. As David has pointed out, there's a kind of a a challenge to each side. But there's a challenge to the anti-federalists, and that is, uh, how, who's going to enforce this Bill of Rights that you want so much? And Madison's point is, this piece of paper, who's going to enforce it? Well, how was it enforced before? And Madison's response is, well, the Bill of Rights was to, supposed to control the monarchy and the aristocracy, and the people could. But how are you going to have the Bill of Rights? You have the people enforce the Bill of Rights against itself. Well, unless they become educated. So part of this is self-restraint. Did the anti-federalists accept expect that the people and the officers in power are going to self-restraint by this Bill of Rights? What's the mechanism? Or to go back to David's point again, is the, the Federalist papers, Federalists are going to say, well. Where is the um, institutional mechanism for for enforcing this Bill of Rights that that you want so much to protect our liberties? Who's going to do it? The judiciary, okay. 
But now you're all scared that that right. he's going to be the most dangerous branch because they're in there forever. Right. <laughs> right. So, so let's just have them in for 12 years. <laughs> <laughs> so we have got a dilemma on our hands. Yes. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, so you can't have Congress enforce it. So it's a kind of it's a dilemma. So I think it. I the more I think of David's point about educative purposes, the more I kind of like it because it. I liked it before, particularly if I saw this as a declaration, as a preamble. This is who we are, but it's supposed to teach. I think representatives what they're supposed to do. But what we've learned, unfortunately, in the 20th century is that representatives don't have to worry about that anymore because that's what the court does. Yeah. Yeah. That's where we're at. <laughs> that's great. Um, it, we're, 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 uh, we've only got about seven, ten minutes left here. So um, this has all been fantastic and uh, very thoughtful. Uh, but I do want to get to another question that came in from Jennifer. Jennifer would like uh, either or both of you to explain Brutus's Brutus One's opinion on, excuse me, on participatory democracy. Yeah, I think <clears throat> that's a good question because I it really it it shows right the emphasis for Brutus right that it's it's the quality it's the engagement and the seriousness with which citizens take their um, uh, take political life, right? That's the major emphasis for Brutus, right? That's the major protection of your liberties. That's the major a way that um, uh, that that um, that's the that's the essence of democracy. And I, the the anti federalists seem to me to have the following point, and that is, look, why would you choose democracy if you don't trust and in, it innately trust people and their judgments? So you know, if for uh, the anti-federalists, right, are concerned about particular types of institutions, but institutions that allow people quickly to be able to check their representatives because ultimately, innately, you want to trust the people. So the best kind of institutions are those, right, where you can quickly correct the abuses of power by representatives, those right. with short terms and where people can be very active and effective. And they right. can't be very active and effective on a broad, on a, in a large national uh, government, but they can be effective at the uh, at the local level of government. So you right. want to keep government small, and you want to keep it so that the representatives are constantly reminded of their attachment to the people, because it's the people that are instinctually good, and that's the only reason why you would want a democracy in the first place. Yeah, I, I would I would argue, build on that, and suggest here's another basic agreement between the anti-federalists and the federalists. Not only do neither side want monarchy, but I don't think either side wants Athens. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. that, that is direct if participatory democracy is understood to be all the citizens gathering on the spot and deciding right away and that's it and you don't need any representative government. Right. I, I mean, it, I, I think so you get a mob. A mob. Well, I think the I think the anti federalists may be more tempted by the by the virtues of that than the federalists. I mean, clear Madison would think that's a mob. So Madison's institutional reliance is is something it's something about mob psychology. When you get people together, they 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 don't become we the people, but they become us the mob. And so representative institutions. Uh, are supposed to filter, supposed to filter that, so you don't gather people on the spot. Now, to again to 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 build on this, so if we agree that both sides want some kind of filtration system rather than direct, then the question becomes: so participatory democracy doesn't mean simply going to the middle of Athens and and. and shouting or whatever it is. Participatory democracy would mean that it, it's not just the right, but it's the duty of the citizen to participate in the issues of the day, read the newspaper, become educated in a practical way. Uh, the schools should be in that, in that fashion. Newspapers should be read widely. Discussions should be held. And candidates should be held responsible. To, uh, to a participating but educated uh, people. And 
as David said, it's very difficult to do that if you have people strewn out all over the place. You've, you've, you've certainly cut down on the possibility of mob action by, by throwing people all over the place and making it more difficult for them to assemble, but you also make it more difficult for them to feel common as, as one and participate. So I think the participatory democracy that Brutus is getting at is an aware, an alive, an alert citizen. But why do you have to be alive, alert citizen? Because those people whom you elect become through power yeah. <laughs> corrupt. I mean, this is one of the, again, this is one of those ironies. We have to elect them so we participate. I, I think the point of departure for the anti federalists again, is not Athens, but rather the following statement, where annual elections end, tyranny begins. Yeah, yeah. And then what, they, what Madison and Hamilton have to do is to say, well, would you be willing to try two years rather than one? Yeah. And so they start off by saying, well, how about four? No, 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 four. You're talking about four years of tyranny. Well, how about three? All right, we'll settle for two. We'll give it to a trust. So I think they, I think it's a moving process that right. that the case and the idea of having a president for life <clears throat> sent shockwaves when when Hamilton said have him for life, and right. that's where Hamilton got his monarchist reputation. Yeah, he he, he yeah he did he <laughs> he brought that on a little bit himself. He did, but <laughs> the only way he could actually bring it on himself and make it stick. It's because the anti-federalists associated long terms in office with anti-republicanism. Right, right. By the way, this is this is all great. This kind of brings me back in a way to a question I wanted to ask earlier, because talking about um, the role of the people and the emphasis that both federalists and anti-federalists anti placed on them in their in, in politics um, reminds me. By the way, that. Um, as we said earlier, there were certain anti-federalist argument, anti-federalist arguments that, that that Publius certainly took seriously, right? But I also want to point out uh, or mention the, the the Publius. Both Hamilton and Madison are not always above, um, I think, exaggerating the anti-federalist views on certain things. And and something you, uh, Gordon and David, were both talking about here reminded me in Federalist Ten. When, him, when Madison makes that great argument toward the extended republic, in order to draw, in order to get to his conclusion in, in the middle of Federalist 10, he says, the que what, here's the question, do we want a democracy in that Athenian sense, right, Gordon? I know, and, uh, and your picture's still up. The, here's the question we need to ask first, do we want a republic or do we want a democracy in that Athenian sense? And, and Madison then says, of course, we don't want that, that Athenian democracy. Well, my point is, neither did the anti-federalists, <laughs> as you said, right? <laughs> so so uh, when I, I just, I know I'm, I don't want to talk too much here in our last few minutes, but that reminds me that the federalists often are good at, um, at saying certain things to portray anti-federalists in a certain way that seem to have stuck in our sort of historical understanding of them. So I'm even thinking of, this came up earlier, in Federalist Number Nine, Hamilton talks about this new, improved science of politics, and uh, the intent is to think: well, the Federalists are the ones who have come up with this new and improved science of politics. But, but the but the Republicanism of anti-Federalists is itself a relatively new, if you want to call it science, itself. Uh, so, so the effect of saying the Federalists have discovered this new and improved science of politics is rhetorically to portray the anti-federalists as is as, as, as hopelessly old-fashioned and maybe even Republican in that old sense, Gordon, you were mentioning earlier. But my point in raising this is the, the, the federalists also not only um, engage in rhetoric to make the anti-federalists look irrelevant, um, they also engage in rhetoric to, to arguments, rhetoric to make them look incoherent. And I thought maybe with our last few minutes, if either of you would like to, t to tackle this question of um, this this charge of the of the Federalists that the anti Federalists were incoherent. Of course, we know. I think it's Federalist thirty eight is I think where Madison makes this makes his comparison of the anti Federalists as not being able to agree on anything. So, what what to, to what extent were the anti Federalists coherent? Well, and the you know one of the 
I mean, one of the arguments that the that the Federalists use against the Anti-Federalists is to say, look, if you really believe in these small republics, you know, your your states are already too big, <laughs> which is not really a great, I don't think a great argument if you're going about, if you're trying to think about <laughs> relative size, but, you know, the yeah. argument is that you, these beloved states of yours are already too big. And that's because in some ways they are exaggerating the republicanism of the anti-federalists. That the anti-federalists aren't trying to build city states, right? In Athens and Sparta. They're and they're wiser than that. But what the what the federalists need to do is to show you that there's two there's two options about thinking about republics. There's the old way of thinking, which comes from Montesquieu, right? Which I mean from Montesquieu, sorry, from Montes Montesquieu is simply reiterating um uh, 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 the the consensus on democracy up until the proposed constitution, and that is uh, democracy is only possible in a small republic. And the Federalists have a radical argument to make, and that is that's wrong, right? That in fact, right, democracies work better in large republics rather than small republics. So they have to sell you on the idea that they're not making a small change but rather a, a great sea change, right, in the way of political thought. And so they have to claim this is a whole new science of politics and we're completely departing from the assumptions and the consensus of the past regarding these things. And it's because of science and because of the enlightenment that we can arrive at these conclusions. Whereas it's perfectly plausible that you could be an enlightenment thinker and think that, you know, um, a moderately small republic is actually better for democracy. They want to pitch this in a in a polarity that probably isn't really the um, generative <laughs> of the debate, right? That's I, Thanks, I think this this notion of um, of irrelevant and incoherent is something that you and I have talked a lot about, uh, Chris. Right. right. Um, and we can go off, you know, go off on that matrix. Uh, Storing, for example, thinks that they're incoherent and relies on Hamilton, and particularly in the in the his early going, um, uh, to to prove that he thinks they're um, incoherent but relevant. Uh, they are incoherent because of Hamilton says well, you, they they realize that something has to be done, but they will not give the means by which to accomplish that end. Therefore, that's incoherent which is a very important sort of storing Hamilton position. If the end is right, then the means don't matter, or they don't matter quite as much. Why are you fussing about means when the end is clear? That's incoherency. And uh, I think part of it could, so for storing, they're relevant. Well, why are they relevant? Because they had the opportunity in 1787 to raise what David has said, the old fashioned um, idea of Republican, maybe even goes beyond Montesquieu, uh, of which Montesquieu is a part, but it's even something further, deeper, more ancient. Um, and they have, and maybe it has something to do with the character of the people. Uh, maybe it has something to do with that, but they, but they didn't have the guts. And my response is because we're living in a country that that was dedicated to liberty. You can't be dedicated to liberty and dedicated to Sparta. Right. Right. So uh, they, I think they were um, more coherent than relevant. Their, their coherency was that they had a certain theory of republicanism that didn't simply rely on uh, the states. I mean, I mean that rhetorically, right. as David said, Madison was able to say, "Well, the states are already bigger than what Montesquieu wanted," and then if the one that comes closest to what Montesquieu might have wanted, Rhode Island, is a mess. <laughs> so the right. so the role of the so the role of the states are not simply to mimic Montesquieu. The role of the states is to are are institutional, in a sense, institutional protections to protect character at the local level. Now what I'm doing is building what David is, 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 has been contributing. So that you have an institutional attachment by the anti-federalists to the states. Not because the states per se represent the character of republicanism, but they protect 
Right. Uh, localism. Right. Um, right. So, and I think that goes from one anti-federalist to another, north to south. In fact, they comment. The other thing is Bill of Rights. It's consistent from north to south, from beginning to end. Yeah. Um, so there's this consistency. Um, now, Cecilia Canyon, who's the other big uh, uh, writer of the anti-federalist, would say, oh, <clears throat> they are uh, coherent, but right. irrelevant. Where a story yeah. would say they're incoherent, but relevant. Kenyon would say they're um, coherent because of the small republic idea. Right. And tournament. But they're, but they're irrelevant. Why? Because they don't understand modern representation with the executive, and, the, and we've moved we've moved away from 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 the from the small. Uh, the, we're now into into post uh, right. Roosevelt uh, post New Deal policy. Uh, therefore, why, it just doesn't make any sense. Right. It's irrelevant, but they are coherent. Yeah, but they have little faith in that new. That that's right. They have they're use Kenyon's faith. title. That's right. exactly yeah. right. Right, yeah. they have met their, their, their and the, li the little faith is they have little faith in this um, uh, post New Deal understanding of right. of public policy and the and um, it, the right. way in which we're supposed to uh, uh, go. Right to think about constitutionalism, the role of government, yes. even federalism. Yeah, so. We're good. Uh, I've kept you both over. I apologize uh, about oh, 10 fine. minutes. Uh, but I'm this, has been, this. <laughs> this has been great, uh, but we have come to the end of our time. So my, my la I want to thank you both very much um, for, for your time and for your thoughts. And um, hopefully you'll, you'll both be willing to, to do this again sometime. The, what, one last question from Jessica. Uh, what would you suggest are the most important of the Federalist and Anti-Federalist papers to read? I'm happy to say <laughs> that there's a short answer to this. Uh, since we're out of time, and that is uh, Gordon has, um, I mentioned this earlier, Gordon has put together um, just absolutely fantastic websites that are available on TAH.org if you're not familiar with them, um, and one of those has to do with the Federalists and Anti-Federalists, and Gordon, I believe you you recently added, at the request of uh, of teachers and students, uh, sort of what are the essentials, if I, if I only have so much time to look at certain Federalists and Anti-Federalists, what are the essentials? And I believe you've added suggestions for that on the website. Yeah, uh, I did put together the essential Anti-Federalists, and as a teacher, of course, I couldn't keep it to one or two. <laughs> right. Um, but with the with the uh, suggestion of Jeremy, and Jeremy needs to be uh, properly praised here because he's always on the alert for what teachers are saying and doing. So Jeremy was the one who suggested to me, why don't you pick some issues, 10 top issues, and try to match up uh, a Federalist with an Anti-Federalist? And I said, you know, it's very, very difficult to match those up uh, because, uh, yeah, just because it's very difficult. Sure, yeah. I, 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 the anti there's, no, there's no one book called the Anti-Federalist Papers written by three people. So there's a certain uh, encouragement of incoherence or, or, or whatever, whereas the Federalist Papers seems to have a certain more coherence to it. Uh, right. But but if you put together this list, which Jeremy encouraged me to do, so there's there are ten issues. What, what's at stake? Their view on the executive, their view on the judiciary, and then the the, the Bill of Rights. So yes, uh, Chris. And through teachers prodding me, I did the essential. And through teachers letting Jeremy know that Jeremy has prodded me. And so that's the most recent edition. Great. There are a lot of great editions. And again, thanks, Gordon. Um, I encourage all of you, if you're not familiar with those websites, they're fantastic, just loaded with resources. Um, uh, you, can, you can get lost in those things which, in a good way. Uh, and spend spend many many hours uh, trying to find all the stuff that Gordon has put in there. So, thank you very much. Yeah, let, me, let me end by that. I, I, I love the praise. I'm I'm glad that you're doing all that. But let's not forget David in this because if you if you go back and you look at this conversation that we had today, Chris, you prodded the questions that people added. But then David did something, and I built on right. David. 
Right. No, I was just about to thank David too. Yeah. <laughs> so good. Yeah. I want to thank you both. Uh, this has been a great comment uh, between both of you. This has been very thoughtful, and uh, I hope that uh, that uh, those joining us have, have found it useful. So yeah, very much, very sincere thanks to both of you for some great thoughts. So, and thanks for joining us. Thanks for your questions. I think they helped the conversation along as well. Um, um, our next Saturday webinar will be October thirteenth. Uh, we'll be looking at uh, what are we look? Are we looking at Jefferson versus Hamilton? I, maybe I believe uh, I should know this. Um, but we'll be joined by uh, Todd Estes of uh, Oakland University and Stephen Knott of the U.S. Naval War College. So I suspect it's Jefferson versus Hamilton. Uh, if, if not, I'm sure that's what'll shape up to be. But again, thanks for joining us, Gordon, David. Thank you so much. As always, it's a pleasure, and I've, I've learned a great deal from both of you. So thanks. Take care until the next webinar. Bye.